individualized treatment in uh, oncology. So I will give you an overview about the molecular aspects in cancer and how we can uh, use our knowledge and uh, targets uh, in terms of the clinical relevance and treatment. Uh, so if we look on different uh, causes of death in Austria, uh, gender-based on the left hand from male, right hand a female, you can see that uh, malignant diseases are responsible for 30% of deaths in, in men and 23% of women. And this is uh, thought to be the second most likely cause of uh, death in not only in Austria but in the Western world after cardiovascular disease. Um, the incidence is increasing, has uh, different uh, reasons. One reason is the main reason, major reason is the, the population is becoming older and older, which is good, but many malignant diseases are diseases of the elderly, and so that uh, these partially explain why the incidence is increasing. So in 2007, in Austria, uh, 35,000 people developed cancer just in Austria. So prostate cancer was the most frequent cancer in male, with 5,000 diseases, while in female it's breast cancer, with also almost 5,000. Lung cancer is increasing in female. Why is that? Because you have to go back for lung cancer for, for smoking in the patient history. And 20 years ago, more and more women started to smoke and there was an increase in smokers, in female smokers, and now we see more female uh, uh, lung cancer patients. While already 20 years ago, uh, male smokers decreased in the... So, uh, when we look here on different uh, types of cancer, um, when we see here uh, the incidence of mortality, you will see that first for the uh, males, the highest incidence is prostate cancer, but only this, the third likely uh, reason for malignant death, because uh, it's more chronic disease, you can live quite a long time uh, with prostate cancer, while for lung cancer, uh, you see that almost every person who has been diagnosed with lung cancer is likely to die from lung cancer, not all, but almost. And then if you look on colon cancer, you see there is a big gap. Not everybody who develops uh, colon cancer dies from colon cancer. So the uh, mortality rate is about 50%. Uh, you can go through all these different kinds of malignant diseases, but then you can see that there are more malignant um, uh, diseases like uh, when you can see here for the stomach, and I'm wondering whether there is listed some other example. There's testicle cancer. Almost nobody dies from testicle cancer uh, because uh, the, the rate of cure is so high. 95% of testicle cancer patients can be cured, but even more than 95%. So not every incidence reflects mortality. How is it with women? We see here breast cancer is very likely to develop, but then uh, Either you can cure it by surgery or by chemotherapy, so not every uh, woman who is diagnosed with breast cancer is going to die from, from it. The same is for uh, uterine cancer and ovarian cancer. It's very good to treat. The same with colon cancer, about 50%. <coughs> um, the question is, uh, who is at risk for lung cancer? Do we have programs that we can screen effectively smokers to say, okay, you are very likely to develop lung cancer if you are smoking, or on the other hand, uh, you are fine if you continue with smoking, but you are very unlikely to smoke, or also for other malignant diseases. Is there a potential that we can uh, identify patients who are at risk uh, to develop cancer? In fact, we have to look into more details. When we talk about lung cancer, lung cancer is not all the same, but we know since many years, we have to differentiate from a histological type of disease. There are adenocarcinomas, squamous cell carcinoma, small cell lung cancer, large cell lung cancer. And we know these are different diseases. It's not all lung cancer, but the different diagnosis, different kinds of treatment, 
uh, different prognosis of this kind of cancer. So uh, we know since long time that we have to differentiate between the histological subtype of lung cancer. But it becomes even more complicated. So these are all adenocarcinomas, and as we are speaking now, we know that approximately half of the patients we can identify in all these adenocarcinomas, a molecular aberration, a molecular mutation uh, in these uh, tumors, which uh, a subgroup uh, all patients with adenocarcinoma into smaller groups of, of patients. So um, we know already how to target uh, mutations like EGF receptor mutations or like, uh, fusion proteins. So as we are talking now, um, there's a different prognosis and kind of treatment uh, in this subgroup of adenocarcinoma patients just by mole doing molecular pathology, but just doing a molecular subtyping of this kind of cancer. It becomes more and more, let's say, complicated on the one hand in the diagnosis, but on the other hand it becomes more clear how we can um, react and we can uh, treat those patients. We know for other mutations, uh, probably in, in, in clinical trials, how we can treat these kind of cancers and others are uh, still in development. But uh, in a few years, probably half of the patients do not see chemotherapy anymore, but they will see a molecular target therapy just by identifying the type of mutation. In 2011, The Economist wrote that cancer is not one disease, it's many, it's true. Yet oncologists have long used the same blunt weapons to find different types of cancer. Cut the tumor out, zap it with radiation or bless it with chemotherapy that kills good cells as well as bad ones. It's true. So we have to learn that cancer is not one disease. So we have uh, really to do our homework first and do a molecular subtyping, a molecular identification. What is the driver mutation? What is the driver of the individual tumor? And then do we have weapons against this individual tumor and treat the patient uh, with an individual treatment concept? So this is from 2003. It's saying this drugs for you. What's in US news? So 2003, we, we did see an oncology in the clinic. <laughs> the treatments, we need to identify the target first and then we have a kind of a personalized treatment approach. 2003, so almost 15 years ago. But first we have to find uh, which patient should get which target of treatment. We have to define this. So this is in German, can I translate this? So far we, we used uh, clinical criteria of course to uh, do a treatment concept to see how indolent or malignant is the behavior of the tumor, uh, what are the comorbidities of the patients, uh, what is the individual treatment aim of the patient, toxicity, and we are also using biomarkers to stratify our treatment. It's not individualizing, but stratifying. But if you have a molecular uh, concept, we're doing gene signatures, and can do molecular subtyping, and then we give uh, the patient subgroup A the treatment A, subgroup B the treatment B, and so on. So I give you an example. Let's go back on lung cancer again. Let's say it's all patients with an adenocarcinoma of the lung. Uh, so far we used for all these lung cancer patients the same chemotherapy given to all patients. What was the outcome? Um, in few patients it worked. The tumor shrank was fine. In other patients, however, there were side effects, but no effects. So they were, let's say, vomiting, had fatigue, didn't do well, need blood transfusion and so on, but the tumor didn't shrink. And then there was a third group where patients had no effect at all. The idea of individualized treatment is that we do our homework first, and we group the patients according to the molecular profile. So we do a molecular subtyping. And then uh, we do an individual treatment concept. So patient A receives treatment A, patient B, treatment B, and we have the success rate of the treatment is higher. I'm not saying that everybody will have a benefit out of this concept, but 
the success rates or the, the, the probability is higher that we can help patients. And on the other hand, we spare unnecessary toxicity to, to those patients who are unlikely to have a benefit out of a specific treatment. So what we are doing is we are picking uh, the green smileys who are very likely uh, to have a good response towards the treatment. We do a negative selection for the red smileys for those who are very unlikely to have a benefit. And then we have the yellow smileys where the toxicity or the probability of toxicity is so high that it would not be justified to uh, give them the treatment uh, for those patients. So what do we need to treat on an individualized basis? We need a target. So we need a well-defined molecular target. And it would be good if this target has a biological function. It's the driver of the tumor cell, which drives the malignant disease. We, it should be easy to measure, either by the pathologist, by staining, or by throwing blood. And the target should correlate with the treatment effect. So let's say. We have a driver mutation which drives the tumor to grow. We have a targeted treatment. It stops the driver. And then we can measure the effect, the ability <coughs> effect, by doing a CT scan or what so on. But what we need is a targeted drug, a drug which most likely should specifically target the uh, mutated molecule. It can be either an antibody if it's a surface protein, or it can be a small molecule, let's say a tyrosine kinase inhibitor or so on. And it would be good if you have a biomarker. A biomarker which is predictive, so which predicts a response to treatment, but it also can be prognostic to say whether the prognosis of the patient is good or bad. So first we need a targeted treatment for cancer uh, to have a specific um, target which we can block. So we have many examples in our daily clinical practice in oncology. Uh, most prominently, one of the oldest uh, target is in breast cancer, the steroid receptor we know, estrogen receptor, uh, uh, for instance, is a target and we can do anti-hormone therapy to treat uh, hormone receptor positive breast cancer patients. We do the same for prostate cancer, but we can do the same also for some kind of lymphoma. We know that for HER2, we have HER2 targeted drugs now since almost 20 years. We use for breast cancer, and since now six, seven years, we can use the very same weapon for gastric cancer if HER2 is overexpressed. So we have that we can use one of the same weapon treatment for two different diseases, but the target is the same. So we have to measure first whether HER2 is overexpressed, it's amplified, and it's amplified in breast cancer. We use HER2 targeted drug, Herceptin. We can use the very same drug if HER2 is uh, amplified in gastric cancer. We have a fusion protein and adenocarcinoma of the lung, CD20 for a specific B cell lymphoma, B cell adult for uh, uh, leukemia, CK for gastrointestinal stroma tumor, and so on. We have here many examples listed. So we learn every year we get one or two more targets, and we have to measure for this before we use this. This is very one good example. Imatinib is a drug which is now in clinical use since 99 or 2000. It's an early drug, it's an tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And it totally changed the treatment of chronic myeloid leukemia. Before, chronic myeloid le leukemia was a um, 100% deadly disease. But it's a very simple, molecular-wise, a very simple disease. It's just one mutation. You have the Philadelphia chromosome, you have the PCR Abel mutation, proteins, so this is the driver. This single driver drives the tumor, the lymphoma, uh, leukemia. And uh, if you can target the PCR Abel uh, with um, the imatinib, you block the disease. We, I wouldn't say you can cure it, because um, sometimes this leukemia can be more clever and develop resistance. However, uh, you can live uh, for many, many years, and it's really a chronic disease. And now we have patients that drug is on the market since the year 2000. Now we have patients already living since 17 years 
just swallowing a pill a day and stabilize this disease so it di disappears from the bloodstream. There are not, no leukemia cells, but if you look um, uh, on a molecular base in the blood for the fusion protein, you might find it. So it totally changed uh, the treatment of chronic myeloid leukemia. But, and that's what we have learned, this is a totally different disease. This is a gastrointestinal stroma tumor. And this gastrointestinal stroma tumor very likely develops either a chick mutation or a BDGF receptor mutation. So those mutations, the same drug, imatinib, also works. Why is that? Imatinib, so this is this drug here for the le le leukemia, is not so specific. It blocks the PCR fusion protein, but it's not so specific. It also blocks Kitter BDGF receptor. So this is a stroma tumor from the GI tract a kind of a sarcoma if you want like this. It's also, let's say, more or less simple disease with one mutation and uh, you use the very same drug in a totally different disease and it works. And it works very rapidly. This is a patient with this gastrointestinal stroma tumor. This is a PET scan. So you know PET, this is um, it's a glucose labeled with a radioactive uh, dye and you can see whatever here is uh, yellow is the, um, is the gist, is the tumor, except of the liver probably at the heart, which can light up, and the kidneys. But this is all metastasis. And after 24 hours of treatment, so just one day later, you see the disease, the metabolic activity is switched off. Uh, like a switch uh, when you switch off the light. Uh, so it works quite rapidly. You can do it the very next day, you do the same scan to see whether the drug works or not. The tumor is still there, but it's not metabolic active anymore. Just switch off the light in the tumor. And it's sustained after three years still, good effect. No chemo anymore, it's just a pill, it's a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So you can talk about crossing anatomic borders. It's very same drug like for the leukemia, in this case works also for chist. Give you another example. We know all the family of her uh, uh, family receptors. Uh, most prominently, you know probably from biology the EGF receptor for signaling, uh, epithelial growth factor receptor. Uh, we have here also the HER2. We know probably for breast cancer it can be amplified, but there's also HER3 or HER4. This is one family of the so called HER family receptors. We know that this is a very likely protein family to be mutated in tumors. There are two amplified in breast cancers or some gastric cancers, EGF receptor mutated in lung cancer or overexpressed in, let's say, colon cancer. And uh, although it's uh, different molecules, it's one family which is likely to be mutated. When we look on that protein family, uh, it's a transmembrane family with a transmembrane uh, domain, an extracellular domain, and an intracellular signaling domain. Uh, and this makes it very good susceptible for uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, or because it's also extracellular, to use an, an antibody targeting. So um, we have. Uh, signaling uh, with, no, um, with no ligand binding. So this is uh, no ligand binding for her too, but this is prefer preferential dimerized. You know what I mean? So this is the, this can lead to dimerization and then it leads to signaling. Plus by dimerization without ligand binding. And this is shown here. So for the EGF receptor, it le needs a ligand to signal. For two, it needs no ligand but dimerization, but it can be also heterodimerization, so two family members of the HER family. Uh, it can be both ligand binding or not, and uh, here also dimerization. And we know that this is uh, very likely to lead to signaling, most likely by, uh, by the ras ralph mcerg pathway, but also by the BS3K AKD pathway. And uh, this is how we test for it. If there's amplification, so it's 
kind of over leads to overexpression of the HER2. Uh, you can use a fish technique, so this is cytogenetic analysis, where you have uh, sounds uh, send it, uh, and you can see whether uh, it's just a normal ratio or it's uh, an amplification where the ratio is above 2.0. And these fish tests are used to test for amplification of uh, HER2, and if HER2 is amplified, you can target it, and it works in the treatment of breast cancer or gastric cancer. And you can see how good this works. So this was just chemotherapy alone. And this is how many percentage of the patients are alive after two, three, four years. And this is a chemotherapy followed by the antibody against HER2. So you can significantly improve the prognosis of the patient if you add to chemotherapy Perceptin, so an antibody against her, uh, her 2 O expression. Again, this was breast cancer. We cross anatomic borders and go to a totally different disease. These are data from gastric cancer. If in gastric cancer, uh, her 2 is overexpressed, so the same molecule, but it's overexpressed, you can use the very same drug. Again, Herceptin that you can significantly improve the uh, prognosis of the patient by just adding Herceptin. Herceptin is very good to tolerate an antibody. You have to watch cardiac function, but normally just adding an antibody to this uh, normal chemotherapy. So the monoclonal antibodies, they inhibit by, bind by binding to the exocellular domain, but we can uh, do a blockage of the ETF receptor also by small molecule ty tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Um, they bind to the ATP binding domain on the cytoplasmic domain of the ETF receptor. And you can see how many different drugs they have been developed by different companies to target the ETF receptor family. Uh, in the clinical use, there's a toximab, uh, it's a clinical panicum, marcapitinib, and also so, you can interrupt me if there are any questions. Yeah? So, the uh, mutations are changed, of course, when we talk about mutations in the genes, they are, or the mutations are not, normally not germline mutations, they're somatic mutations, so developed mutations in the DNA of the tumor cells. Uh, so they are developed uh, spontaneously, it's not germline. Um, and uh, this can happen either by radiation, by chemical, uh, uh, by chemical exposure or whatsoever. Um, so in the tumors we are most likely talking about somatic mutations, so they develop uh, within a normal cell, they uh, turn to be malignant and uh, so the malignant cells they normally harbor between three and five driver mutations, with some exceptions. Um, the germline mutations, germline mutations are responsible for inherited diseases. So we know this, for instance, for BSCA1, BSCA2 mutations, or Lynch syndrome, HMPCC. These are uh, germline mutations. And when we look on the family history, we ask, the patient, do you have other family members, uh, first grade family members with the very same disease? And they tell you, yeah, my mother had uh, also colon cancer, and it's the same as her father. And then uh, you, you, you should listen carefully because it's probably most likely that there is a germline mutation. Uh, but we are talking most likely about somatic mutation. <laughs> by deletion of nucleotide, by translocation, or by insertion uh, of the nucleotide. So different kind how mutation can develop uh, in an somatic cell. That the, as a consequence, um, the amino acid sequence um, becomes altered. And uh, due to the mutation, either it can be an, a silent mutation, so no consequences on biology, but it can be an activating mutation, so 
that the uh, molecule becomes activated, although there is no upstream signaling, it just is active by itself. And we have many good examples in uh, tumor biology uh, where we have activating mutations. Um, yeah, and there can be also inactivating mutations, of course. When we look again on the EGF receptor, we can see that there might be activating mutations within the EGF receptor. Uh, these activating mutations then lead to signaling into the cell without ligand binding, without dimerization of the EGF receptor. Just by the mutation and EGF receptor signals all the time. Uh, it's like the light is I'm always telling my, my patients how they can imagine how a Tyson kinase inhibitor works. I'm telling them, imagine your tumor cell is an, or a, a normal cell in the body is a room. And normally a light goes on, goes off, and tells the cell what to do. And then another light goes on and off, and another light goes on and off. But in your tumor cell, two or three lights are on all the time. And these lights are stimulating your tumor cell all the time and it starts to grow and doesn't stop to grow anymore and, and, and it's, uh, there is a mitosis going on and, and <coughs> metastasis formation. The tyrosine kinase inhibitors, they should switch off the light again in the cell. Yeah? And so the patients understand what I mean with this normally. And uh, this is how you can imagine this. So if this is a driver mutation, it just gives you the signal all the time uh, and uh, you have to try to switch it off. So for EGF receptor mutation, we know different kind of mutations for the for adenocarcinoma of the lung. Examples are the uh, most likely T1790 mutation, but there are also some other mutations known. And we, if these um, mutations are in tyrosine kinase uh, domain, the signaling is always on. It signals in the cell and these are most likely activating mutations. Luckily, nowadays we have, as you have seen before, many tyrosine, tyrosine kinase inhibitors where you can specifically target the EGF receptor and switch off the light. So um, we know that some patients with non small cell lung cancer with other carcinoma, they have a very good response towards the treatment of EGF receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And they have higher response, so better treatment response than towards chemotherapy. They live longer, they have a better prognosis. So I can tell you a true story. This was this summer. Um, me as a medical oncologist, they called me to um, a woman, 35 years old, so rather young woman. Uh, she just gave birth to a baby. She was uh, just, yeah, the day before, she gave birth to her second baby and she was saying during she was pregnant, she has pain in her hip. Uh, but when you're pregnant, you do not do x-ray or CT scan because you're pregnant. So they were saying, okay, this is because you're pregnant and it's probably, uh, you can have pain somewhere. But it didn't stop after she, after the uh, uh, gave birth. And so they were doing the next day and just an x-ray of the pelvis and they were seeing a lesion in the bone. So they did the CT scan and they were seeing that she had uh, three or four bone metastases and the primary tumor in the lung. Five centimeters. Uh, so of course a catastrophe, she was of course crying, 35 year old, non-smoker. Um, Everybody, also my other doctors were saying, oh, we are so sorry, you are not going to live very long anymore, and uh, lung cancer, it's uh, the median survival is a year probably. And um, I was saying, no, I'm not so sure, we should do a biopsy first, and to see whether this is not one of these cancer with an EGF receptor mutation, because whether the young, younger patients, the non-smokers, have these kind of mutations. So we say, no, we don't want to waste time, shouldn't we do chemotherapy and it's severe and shouldn't we start it? No, we have to <laughs> time and a good diagnosis. It's, uh, the good diagnosis is the same as important than the right treatment or to find the right treatment. So it happened that yeah, two weeks passes, they were very devastated, of course, and then we had the result. Indeed, EGF receptor mutation. So I said, congratulations, we know that it's, uh, it's lung cancer, uh, it has an EGF receptor mutation. It was a good mutation. Uh, like now, she was also not so very much convinced, but I congratulate her. And they were saying, so she was 
was it? Why do we start Kima? I don't know Kima. Did you see your pill? She said, just the pill? I said, yeah, we see. And she was uh, taking the pill and the pain disappeared. And after three months, we were doing the first CT scan. Uh, the bone lesion was sclerotic. This is a good sign. Um, and the primary tumor shrink to only 50% in size, just by patient dosing, kind of no chemo, no side effects, no hair loss, no vomiting, nothing. Um, so I was calling the thoracic surgeon and saying, look, we had a very good response. Now cut the tumor out, and these three bone lesions we, are, we sent there for radiation because you can cut it out the bone lesions and you can do a, a, a radiotherapy and she continues with the pill. So in October she, she underwent surgery. After three days she could be already uh, dismissed and, and she's at home with the baby. Uh, the, the, the tumor is, is uh, she underwent surgery, they cut out the tumor, the three bone metastases are burned by radiation and she's continuing with the like cured. Uh, no disease left. Okay? Do not say that the tumor is, cannot come back, but the prognosis is much better. So even if the, she wouldn't undergo surgery, the prognosis is many years with a pill. So um, one of the first studies were patients with adenocarcinoma, uh, never light smokers, and they were giving chemotherapy and comparing it with gefitinib. This is an EGF receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And uh, what they showed here was that gefitinib was a little bit better than chemotherapy. So this was a priority not so much uh, uh, convincing, but if they looked on the subtypes for those patients who had an EGF receptor mutation, gefitinib did much better. And these were patients with no EGF receptor mutation. Gefitinib had no effect. The patient died earlier. So it only makes sense to give an EGF receptor inhibitor if the tumor bears an EGF receptor activating mutation. Now we know this. Now it makes sense. But 2008, they didn't know that just giving everybody. Different disease, same molecule. EGF receptor in correcting cancer. There we do not see mutations in the EGF receptor, but overexpression. EGF receptor is very often overexpressed in colorectal cancer, and again, EGF receptor does signature structure by Rastrop, McGurk, and BS3 kinase AKD. However, we see other mutations in colorectal cancer. Approximately half of our patients, they have RAS mutations, so downstream of the EGF receptor. If RAS is mutated, it's an, activated, an activating mutation. So it signals all the time. And if we block EGF receptor with an antibody, it's not working because downstream RAS is doing a signal transduction all the time. So it doesn't make sense to give patients and blocking EGF receptor antibody if there is a mutation in the, in the K-RAS or N-RAS molecule. However, it works pretty good if there is no mutation downstream. So we can block ligand binding to the EGF receptor and this is a very active, good antibody treatment uh, interestingly, the side effects are very good manageable. It makes pimples in the on the skin and so you know, to look like coolers. But here again, what I mean: these are patients in blue with the antibody, and in yellow, just chemotherapy alone. If there is no mutation, they're doing better if you add the antibody. However, if there is a downstream mutation, activating mutation, you, they do worse. So you harm the patient if you get an antibody, if there is an activating mutation downstream. So now, this were also studies from 2010, now it's obligatory to do first a RAS mutation testing before we give an anti-EGF anti receptor blocking antibody to correct a cancer patient. Now we know that only those patients who do not have mutations, who are ras white type, they potentially have a benefit out of the treatment with an anti-EGF receptor mm -hmm. antibody plus chemotherapy. So this is what I mean. If there is downstream mutation, 50% have a ras mutation of our patients, and there's also another molecule downstream, BRAF. In 5 to 10% of the correct cancer patient, there is a BRAF mutation, but it's either or. 
So we have to check also for B right. Is anybody somehow working with tumor cells in, in the lab or so? Yeah, there are some. Okay. Um, we know B rough mutations are very likely in what kind of disease? In melanoma, the bad skin tumors. In almost 50% of melanomas, B rough is mutated. And so, clever pharmaceutical companies, they develop an uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor against BRAF. It works pretty very well in melanoma. And it works also, but you have to combine it in correct cancer if you combine it with other targeted drugs. Unfortunately, there is no KRAS targeted drug yet. Because it's not a tyrosine kinase, it's a GDPase. And GTPases are more difficult to block than tyrosine kinases. Don't ask me why I'm not a biologist, but things like this. And we see if we do our homework and we do a molecular profile, you are pre-selecting those patients who might have a benefit out of the treatment, but by pre-selecting the right patient for the right treatment, your success rate is higher. Old study, 2010. At that time, you could do this study. In the meantime, it's standard. They were giving this anti-EGF receptor antibody to patients unselected. <laughs> had a benefit of this treatment. But if you were selecting only those patients who are ras type, have no RAS mutation, you are increasing the response rate to 36%. If you uh, skip the um, NRAS mutated, 38%. If you skip the uh, fixed VCE mutated, 40%. And uh, they could demonstrate that if you only give those patients with no downstream mutation the anti-HF receptor antibody, you are doubling up almost the success rate. So, and this is standard now. So what we do when the patient comes in, we are asking for a molecular profile, and we do the molecular profile first, and then uh, we're deciding which treatment is best for the patient. We are stratifying our patients. This is not individualized therapy, but it's a stratified therapy. Um, back to the last slide, why can't you then use BRAF inhibitors for KRAS constitutively active? Yeah. yeah, because KRAS is not only, it's not bio biology, it's not, not always that simple. KRAS is not only doing downstream signaling, but it's also doing upstream signaling. And if KRAS is mutated, it should block BRAF. It's not sufficient because you also have CRAF, ARAF, and it goes up to the EGF receptor. And it's also RAS is activating indirectly the PS3 kinase AKT pathway. And so it's not sufficient to just block downstream one molecule. They tried it, but it's, it's insufficient. However, the tumor. You know, many kind of cancers are not curable. So the tumor becomes eventually resistant towards the treatment. It's not like the tumor is mutating, but we are selecting clones. We are selecting clones, you know, the tumor saturated channels, and by treatment, by uh, targeting the EGF receptor, it works pretty nice, but there are resistant clones and they start to grow and grow and grow and then eventually we see the a resistance towards the disease. And in the meantime, now in 2016, we can easily detect it not by rebiopsing the tumor, but by just drawing blood and uh, looking for circulating cell-free tumor DNA. So we can detect mutations just in the bloodstream. Not in the tumor cells, which are eventually in the bloodstream, but we can detect circulating tumor DNA in the blood of the patient. And this is demonstrated here. This is a single patient who had a high, uh, a big liver lesions of 8 centimeters. They started treatment with chemo plus tuximab. He had a very good response here, the blue bars. You can see the uh, tumor marker CA was going down. And this was very good working, but nine months before the tumor became resistant and started to grow again, they could already detect a mutation in the KRAS, so downstream of the EGF receptor. So tuximab is an EGF receptor antibody. So downstream, the tumor developed a mutation, and this was resistant towards the treatment, 
In fact, it didn't develop, but you selected the clone. And nine months before the patient became resistant, you could already detect that the tumor will become resistant towards this treatment. So this works, and you can quantify this with this beaming technology, and then you see uh, already in advance whether the patient will become resistant or not, and what's the mechanism of resistance. This works, you can do it, uh, but we don't know how to react on this. That's the problem. So we are talking about circulating cell-free tumor DNA, um, and this is not very new, but it's a very hot topic still. We know the technique is working, but now we have to translate it into the clinical practice. Why is it so important? It's a non-invasive biomarker. Just drawing blood, we do it with our patients every two weeks that we draw blood, so just take an extra tube and you can uh, analyze the cell-free tumor DNA can be isolated from plasma serum, but any body fluids, also from urine, for instance. Uh, it allows you to serial monitor the tumor genome. You know, the tumor genome is not stable, it's an instable. And so uh, we've just drawn the blood and doing the analysis of ctDNA, it's quite easy to, to analyze the cell-free tumor DNA. It's AppCam independent, AppCam is used for the circulating tumor cells. We don't need that, it's cell-free DNA and uh, it reflects the average of the tumor genome. So it's not just one cell is like this, the other is like this, it's the average, it's a good thing and, and good average of this. Where do we need, where do we use already uh, uh, nucleic acid monitoring? We use this since many, many years for chronic viral diseases like HIV, uh, hepatitis, where we monitor the RNA of the virus. The, the, the tumor, uh, the virus load of the disease. So we monitor how good is the monitoring the copy numbers of the RNA of, of uh, the HIV virus. Or so the same we do for chronic hepatitis C, and uh, we can easily do this now also for DNA uh, for the tumor DNA. So the technique is developed. It works. Let's talk about biomarker. What it, yeah. um, is there anything known about the percentage of, of um, cell-free tumor DNA that yeah. is really derived so that is really derived from the tumor? Because I mean, after of course, it loss depends from patient to patient, but it yeah. can be up to five to ten percent okay. of all the circulating DNA. Uh, the detection is quite good. You can go down uh, in one thousandth of uh, the uh, uh, percentage to detect tumor DNA. Mm -hmm. The question is. Um, and this, while uh, studies are ongoing and now, what are the consequences of it? If we can detect something, mm -hmm. what is the clinical consequence of it? Uh, should we change the treatment earlier if we detect the resistance? Should we wait until uh, the, uh, the tumor is growing? So these are where the, story, uh, the, the, the clinical trials are going on. But let's talk about biomarkers. Biomarkers are defined uh, as uh, something which can be objectively measured and evaluated as indicators of either normal biological processes or pathological processes or pharmaceutical, pharmacological response to therapeutic intervention. Difficult defin uh, definition on Monday evening, uh, what is Wednesday evening? <laughs> At night shift. So, we use biomarkers in the clinical practice. Biomarkers can be used in clinical practice to either identify the risk of a disease or to stratify patients. I gave you some examples already to stratify patients or to assess the severity of a disease or progression of the disease, to predict prognosis or to guide treatment. I give you then some examples. This is a one example of the prognostic factor. Let's say the prognostic factor, if it's here, it's, it's yellow, we see, okay, if the patient or the tumor has this prognostic biomarker, he has a better prognosis. So we can use prognostic biomarkers to see whether the prognosis is better or not. We see, okay, we can say the patient, your prognosis is better because your tumor expressed this or this, so we can detect this or this in your bloodstream. We have also a negative Pro, uh, prognostic, uh, sorry, now we are predictive. Predictive is saying whether someone is, has a benefit of a treatment. 
does. It's not prognosis, means overall survival, whether it lives long or longer, it lives longer or not. Predictive is saying you whether a treatment is likely to work or not. This is an example. Let's say there is a biomarker expressed. It's saying, okay, this patient is unlikely to have a benefit, like the RAS mutation for the EGF receptor treatment. If it's there, unlikely that the patient has a benefit of the treatment. So it's a negative predictive marker. But it can be the opposite, a positive predictive marker. Do you know an example? EGFR mutation. Right, EGFR mutation I gave you before. If there's an EGR, EGFR mutation and we want to treat with an EGF receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitor, it's more likely that the patient has a benefit of it. So it's a positive predictive marker. It predicts whether the treatment might work or not. So there are also other markers. Markers with no prog uh, uh, prognostic or predictive meaning. It's just there, but it doesn't say whether the patients live longer or the treatment might work longer. So this can be also markers. There might be um, a predictive marker which is not pro prognostic. It's saying, yes, if you treat the patient, he will have a better, prognos a better outcome of the treatment, but only if you treat the patient. If you do not treat the patient, it doesn't say anything. So the prognosis is not different, but it predicts you whether a treatment works or not. Predicted mark. The opposite, or let's say another meaning, is the prognostic, but not predictive. So it's saying, okay, if the marker is there, positive, the patient has a worse prognosis. So the disease is more aggressive. Independently, whether the patient is treated or not. Something which is prognostic and predictive. It's saying, okay, if the marker is there and you treat the patient with this treatment, the prognosis will be better. He will live longer. It's prognostic and predictive. The same can be in a positive way. But if you give a certain treatment, it will even live more longer, even better. That can be predictive and prognostic. Let's say we know this. Here is an example. Hormone receptor positive breast cancer have a better prognosis than there is no hormone receptor. So the prognosis is better. But if you treat them with an anti-hormone treatment, it's even better. So it's predictive and prognostic. Far so clear, predictive prognostic, the differences. It's boring. <laughs> so when we talk about outcomes of oncological trials, we are talking most likely about response rate, but even more likely about survival, survival analysis. Survival analysis is a statistical uh, analysis which compares a time span. It's not it can be overall survival, so time from diagnosis till the patient dies. It's overall survival, but it can be also other kinds of survival. Disease-free survival, progression-free survival, uh, recurrence-free survival, what's all. Huh? So it means it compares the time to an event between two or more groups. It used to estimate the efficacy of a medical treatment, let's say, how many months the, the tumor or the disease is not progressing as long as the patient has this treatment compared to a control group? An event can be that the patient dies, but also other endpoints are possible. Let's say that how long it uh, needs that the patient is cured or that the, the, the tumor relapses or uh, the disease relapses or is progressing. The examples are very likely given in Kaplan-Meier curves. So what I showed you before that was Kaplan-Meier curves. How many percentage of the patients are stable or are <coughs> alive or whatsoever? Huh? These are examples. I'll give you this before. These are Kaplan-Meier curves. It's showing the probability of progression-free survival. So how many percentage of the patients in the group did not progress with the disease when they are under treatment. You can see here, after a year, 12 months, only 10% of 
did not progress when they were treated with chemotherapy. If you go up, 40% did not progress when they received the defeating it. Uh, and you can do a median. You can say the median uh, progression-free survivors of 50% is for the chemotherapy six months and for the gefitinib nine months. So you can say there's a delta of three months. And then you can do mathematics and do risk reduction progression. It's shown here with the hazard ratio, 50% uh, risk reduction. Who is interested in statistics? It's saying at every time point, the patients uh, which are EGF receptor mutated uh, have a 50% reduction to progress with the disease when they were treated with gefitinib. So they did twice as good as when they were treated with. Um, chemotherapy. So survival times, we have to uh, define the start point. Is it the diagnosis of the disease? Is it the start of the treatment, randomization of the trial, or surgery, or whatsoever? Yeah? So you have to define the start point. And of course, you have to define the end point. Overall survival would mean until the patient is dead, or relapse free survival when the disease recurs, or distance metastasis uh, occurs. So you have to define the survival time, and then you define uh, what you mean. I give you an example over survival, diagnosis of the disease until the patient dies. Um, Cancer-specific survival can be um, times of diagnosis until the patient dies from cancer. But here, over survival would also be when he has a car accident or commits suicide. It's also over survival. But here, it's just when the patient dies from cancer. So it's a little bit more specific. Recurrence free survival would mean the patient undergoes surgery, it's, he is cured, but the patient relapsed, had a recurrence of the disease. What was the time in between? Disease free survival, more or less the same. Metastasis free survival, uh, when it's located until it has. Uh, um, Metastasis. And then you can uh, put the optimization of treatment. You have more effective chemotherapy uh, uh, protocols. You should integrate uh, molecular targeted drugs into your treatment. I gave you some examples. You can combine targeted drugs or you can combine targeted drugs with uh, chemotherapy. And you can individualize the therapy based on the molecular. Here in uh, Medical University, we have a platform for molecular uh, analysis and molecular treatment of patients. So, inclusion criteria is that the patient run out of standard treatment options. We have luckily more and more patients who are fit enough to say um, to have a good quality of life after all the chemo uh, fails, and then they're saying, "Okay, what's next?" And the oncologist is saying, "You know, you had all these kind of treatments, and now you're resistant to this." But we can do a molecular profile, probably find something. And now we have more than 300 patients already went through this molecular profiling. Couldn't help everybody, but we could help some patients very effectively in prolonging their life by doing this uh, profile. Um, good examples are giving. I was giving you this already before. The two of expression, there's two sum up. We need uh, a cytogenetic analysis. CKIT overexpression can be done by immune histochemistry. Um, we can do EGF receptor mutation quite easily with next generation sequencing. Uh, the same with KRAS and BRAF mutations. And we have targeted drugs in our hand. So, uh, the four more main questions for individualized treatment is what materials should we analyze? Is it sufficient that we take the specimen from surgery five years ago? because the tumor genome is instable, or sh should we do a re-biopsy of fresh tumor that we know how is the tumor working now? Uh, what should we do for analysis? Do we do cytogenetic analysis, immunity chemistry, next generation sequencing? Which markers are we looking for? Does it make sense to do a whole exome sequencing? Or is it sufficient if we just do those analysis where we have targeted treatments against? How much time is required to provide the molecular data? 
the turnover time is important for patients uh, who have a progressing disease. So which biological material depends, of course, on the marker we want to look for. Normally, we do DNA, RNA, protein analysis. Uh, most likely, we do it from tissue, either fresh frozen or butterfly embedded. But I gave you examples for a liquid biopsy where serum or plasma is sufficient. Which technology is required? We do, of course, immunohistochemistry chemistry for EGF receptor staining, for instance, and do ELISA for blood uh, biomarkers on the protein levels. Uh, we do uh, NGS or RTQ PCR based technologies. Uh, we can do sequencing, whole exome sequencing, uh, methylation specific <coughs> PCR for epigenetic analysis of microarray mm -hmm. chips. So, thank you very much for your attention, and we have some time for questions. Yeah, of course, um, size always matters. Um, it's also important what kind of disease it is. Yeah? Uh, chemotherapy is not uh, as efficient, of course, as a knife. So um, in many different tumor types, um, surgery is the only way to potentially cure a patient. However, we have other examples, let's say for testicle cancer, where chemotherapy is most likely to be so efficient to cure a patient, but there are other diseases, let's say like colon cancer, where we know chemotherapy is effective in controlling the disease, in shrink the disease, but we need the surgeon to, to do surgery to potentially cure the patient. Um, then it depends when you're talking about radiotherapy, again, where is the location of the tumor, whether radiotherapy makes sense or not. With the rectal cancer, you can do radiotherapy, but Colon cancer you not cannot do because the colon is more flexible and uh, you cannot do radiotherapy. So it's a difficult question which we cannot I cannot give you a clear answer. So it depends on the tumor type, right? You are right on the size of the tumor, on treatment alternatives, and then you can decide what, uh, which treatment is the best. But you are right. The size matters, of course, whether radiotherapy or a surgery or the invasion to other organs is. So uh, the first line of treatment is not molecular targeted therapy. So how depends. <laughs> depends on the disease. Let's go back to breast cancer. Yeah. If you see there is an HER2 overexpression, you add of course an anti-HER2 antibody to your chemotherapy. So front up. But when you look at it yeah. first yeah. here at the Akaha, yeah, because course. before I thought you you told us. If it's not, if it's, if there is no other option, then we will okay. do this. So Receptor. Of course, we do this for, this for breast cancer front up. HER2 as well, the same HER2 we do for adenocarcinoma of the gastric. Uh, EGF receptor mutation for lung cancer front up, KRAS or RAS mutation for colon cancer, BRAF mutation for skin cancer, but also colon cancer. <laughs> so there are some standard mutations we screen for, and there are others which are not standard, but you might look for because we have some evidence that it also makes sense to do so. Yes? Are CAR T cells also used in Austria? Say it again, what kind of test? CAR T cells, is the generic antigen receptor for B cell lymphoma? I'm not a hematologist. You might be, have you asked a hematologist? Because 
So this is priming of. Uh, yeah, you put retroverse inside the sector. Yeah, you have to ask a hematologist. I would wonder whether this is standard, but probably have you some. You can verify it because uh -huh. it's only treatment and patient. Okay. Yeah, do you have to ask the hematologist, not me. I'm an oncologist. <laughs> <laughs> I still have a question to this person. Yes. How come there are no side effects? There are side effects, potential side effects. Um, HER2 is also expressed in um, the cardiac muscle. And HER2 antibodies might affect cardiac function. So you have to do first, especially if, the, if uh, there is a cardiomyopathy unknown. So the, the heart muscle is not something that's good anymore. But we send all our patients before we start treatment uh, for a sonography of the heart. And we do the same after several months to monitor the cardiac function. This is the most likely side effect with Herceptin. Yeah. Yes, uh, just a short comment because you mentioned that basically with targeted therapy we only select for already resistant cells. Mm -hmm. But I think about a year ago there were two studies that kind of showed that it could also be that we apply mutations during treatment because there are basically cells that either don't get as much drugs before and then justify it, which would be random, or that they actually have like uh, epigenetic color transcription or down regulation of the certain factors and then later on maybe acquire mutations. So in this case it might make sense also, which is probably only for some special cases, but still could uh, happen then that it makes sense to do some epigenetic, epigenetic treatment or anything on, along the way to kind of avoid the development of resistance. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, we know that the tumor genome is, is not stable. And this brings me back to that what I have demonstrated here with the liquid biopsies, where we see what's well, not on anymore, where we see that patients can develop resistance during treatment. But we see that we can detect resistant clones. We have just a hypothesis that the resistant clones are most likely already exist from front up, and we just um, downregulating or killing uh, uh, the clones which are susceptible to a chemotherapy, and those who are resistant overgrow the others, and then we can detect it or start to detect it. But it was never zero. Yeah? So you can detect the, the, the clone probably also earlier. But you are right, there are mechanisms of developing resistance, not only on a molecular basis, but sometimes also on resistance mechanism. We have many good examples where drugs, uh, why, for instance, the ABC proteins can be uh, kicked out of the cells, etc. And what uh, the outcome is, uh, the bottom line is, uh, it's not sufficient just to do a molecular profile or to do an analysis from the baseline. You would have to re-biopsy the patient or at least go for the blood and do the analysis real time. You're absolutely right, you have to do this. Especially for long term cell culture, basically it's saw that after they treated with the drug, ultra deep sequencing, you couldn't find mutation. And then kind of yeah. selected for the resistant clones or waited mm -hmm. until resistant clones emerged. And right. Then later on, they really found the okay. So in a controlled sure. setting, basically. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah I think also for solid process. tumors, it's more complicated. Like for hematology, it's more easy. In hematology, you sometimes have just one mutation, and uh, you know. <laughs> this kind of leukemia, that the resistant clones are there from the baseline on, and you are selecting the resistant clones. Um, in solid tumors, it's probably more complicated. It's more heterogeneous, and then you're also developing resistance, and on the other hand, also selecting resistance. Any other questions? If not, was it the last uh, for today? You can go home now and relax. I wish you a nice evening. <laughs>